the AI for Good Global Summit convened by ITU recognizes the joint responsibility of governments, the private sector, United Nations agencies, academia and others to ensure AI reaches its full potential while preventing and mitigating harms. And it's a moment that calls for action. And today I'm calling on each of you, each of you to use this summit to help the world to better understand what kinds of regulations, what kinds of guardrails we need to put in place right now. So together, let's make it innovative, let's make it safe, and let's make it responsible for all. Thank you very much. Welcome to AI for Good, the leading action-oriented, global and inclusive United Nations platform on AI. Organized by ITU, in partnership with 40 UN sister organizations, and co-convened with Switzerland. The goal of AI for Good is to identify practical applications of AI to advance the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and scale those solutions for global impact. In today's session, we're counting on you to use the live video wall feature to ask questions and post comments to help create an engaging discussion. We encourage you to stay until the end to chat, connect, ask questions, and network with our distinguished panelists and world-class AI experts in the neural network. It is now time to kick off the session and welcome our first speaker. The floor is yours. Good afternoon, uh, morning, and night, uh, friends of AI, Earth and Sustainability. Uh, first of all, I would like to welcome everyone to our second talk in this seminar series on AI and Earth and Sustainable Science. Um, this seminar series in the program AI for Good of ITU is actually co-convened by myself, Gustav Kamps, but also Marcus Reistein, Joachim Denzla, and Maria Piles. I was initiated in the context of the Excellence Network Alice for the Development of AI in Europe. Um, well, first of all, thanks for attending the meeting, all of you. And today we will hear about machine learning and how can machine learning uh, help us in monitoring emissions, but also in mitigation and sequestration. It is my absolute pleasure to present our speaker today, Alexandra Abdaspremont. Alexandra earned his PhD both from Ecole Polytechnique in France and, and Stanford University in optimization and finance. And then after a postdoc at UC Berkeley, he joined Princeton University as an assistant and then associate professor. He returned to Europe around 10 years ago, more or less, and became research director at CNRS in Paris. He has received many awards, projects, and distinctions, including a prestigious URC grant. And he also is a founder of Kairos, uh, a company focuses, that, that focuses on energy markets and earth observations altogether. Uh, welcome and thank you for being with us today, Alexander. And over to you. Uh, really looking forward to your talk. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction, Gustavo, and uh, thank you for the invitation. Let me share my slides. Um, can you see my slides okay? Yes, perfect. Perfect. Yeah, so today I'm going to talk about work uh, that I've been doing with a company called Chaos, uh, which is focused on uh, climate intelligence and Earth observation. And the idea is to basically... Uh, cover the fact that um, the, there's been a sort of sea change in our capabilities in obs Earth observation in the last decade or so. On one hand, uh, the European Union has launched this very, very ambitious program of Earth observation with constellations of satellites uh, carrying a, a very wide array of sensors uh, and providing images of the Earth um, at a, a, a fairly high revisit frequency every day or so. Uh, and at the same time, our capability uh, to process these images, uh, the vast volumes of information coming from these constellations has changed dramatically as well, uh, thanks to the advent of, of uh, machine learning and advances in um, pattern recognition and image processing. 
So we are really at the sort of junction between a, a significant improvement in our uh, Earth observation hardware and capabilities, uh, together with a very significant improvement in our capacity to handle uh, and, and uh, process all this information. And so today I would like to focus on a few applications. I'm not going to spend too much time on the methodology, but I'll spend some time advertising problems and questions and, and um, uh, uh, scenarios where um, a combination of Earth observation and machine learning uh, produces uh, uh, very impactful outcomes. And I'll probably start with um, uh, discussing forest and carbon sequestration. Um, uh, you might have heard of uh, uh, carbon credits as uh, and forest uh, forestry as a way of, of creating carbon cre credits for uh, carbon sequestration. Um, and um, this has been in the news recently. I'll say a few words about this in the next slide. Uh, but basically, using the constellation uh, like uh, the, the Sentinel constellation from the EU, um, we can track with a lot more precision the amount of biomass stored in forests. And uh, so forests are a sort of tried and true technology for sequestering carbon. Uh, but the idea is that uh, this is not really useful if you cannot check that the carbon that's supposed to be uh, there in a carbon sequestration project is in fact being sequestered by the forest. So thankfully, we, we now have, thanks to Sentinel, for example, and the Landsat program in the US that has been running for 30 years, we now have a very broad constellation of sources that allow us to track uh, and precisely measure the amount of biomass sequestered by forest. We have satellites, for example, uh, covering producing images in the optical domain, so traditional RGB images, with a fairly high resolution, sometimes for civilian sources as, as good as uh, 30 centimeters. We also have satellites that scan the Earth using uh, radar sensors, and the backscatter of these radar sensors can be used to uh, tell us something about uh, biomass and vegetation on, on the ground. We also have satellites with LIDAR, which essentially measure the height of the terrain or the height of uh, uh, trees from directly from space with a fairly high precision. Um, and we can use these satellites to train uh, a deep learning model to predict uh, tree height uh, over very large areas. We also have uh, microwave satellites that use the fact that the Earth itself emits a, a sort of background uh, of, of uh, microwave uh, um, uh, signal. And the absorption of this microwave signal by the vegetation can give us an idea of the amount of biomass in the canopy. And finally, we have multispectral satellites like Sentinel-2, for example, which uh, cover not only uh, the visible domain, but also the shortwave infrared, for example, uh, that can be used directly to uh, say something about uh, the uh, vegetation health, the type of vegetation we are looking at, um, and uh, track uh, 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 um, uh, deforestation, for example, and, and fires. So all these sensors, give us a fairly comprehensive picture of forests and biomass worldwide and can be used to try to understand how much carbon is actually being sequestered by forests uh, on a global basis. And we can do this at scale. And this is important because uh, carbon credits so far have not been sort of uh, backed, uh, have not always been backed by uh, very serious measurement reporting and verification ca capability. And so the uh, historical uh, carbon credits that were produced by some of these certifying authorities have been uh, put into question. Uh, and the quality of these credits uh, uh, has uh, suffered a lot from a lack of direct measurement and reliable measurements. And I would like to argue that uh, uh, Earth observation satellites combined with machine learning give us a unique opportunity to provide uh, a reliability to these uh, carbon credit markets. Um, so how does it work? Well, uh, 
we can track uh, several uh, um, uh, important quantities related to forest health using uh, multispectral satellites. Because of high using high resolution images, for example, we can track uh, selective pruning of, of trees and forests. We can also track fires uh, that are a precursor typically to defore uh, large scale deforestation. And we can track deforestation itself in a um, um, uh, sort of real time of, uh, form of fashion or close to real time fashion. Um, so this is an example on a red project in the Amazon, if I'm correct. Um, and what you see is that uh, the project itself, which is in this green sort of polygon, has been has sort of escaped massive deforestation, but the entire forest around it has seen some fairly severe deforestation occurring. And so this uh, plot of, of uh, forest, which was supposed to be protected by this uh, uh, project and the uh, uh, accompanying uh, carbon credits um, is is in fact not really delivering on its mission to uh, to save uh, a biomass because uh, uh, around it uh, the, the the forest is being pruned pruned at a fast clip. Red is a uh, program by which uh, uh, developed countries transfer funds to developing countries to help them protect their biomass. And of course, this only works if it's accompanied by reliable measurement reporting and verification capabilities. And what we see here with uh, uh, these observations taken from, uh, from uh, the Sentinel constellation is that even though the project itself is saving a lot of biomass, um, it's, it's the surrounding forests are being deforested at a very fast uh, pace. And so there, there is significant biomass loss uh, despite the, the uh, protection, relative protection offered by the project itself. Uh, we can, because all of this is done now uh, uh, automatically in a sense, or in batch by uh, machine learning, we can run these algorithms to track uh, biomass and deforestation at very large scale. So this is an example we've run on the Amazon at large scale, uh, which produces a, both a map of uh, above ground biomass for the entire Amazon basin and a change in uh, carbon density in the last in the 10 years between 2011 and 2021. And we can clearly see here plots of deforestation at uh, the Amazon scale. And again, the reason we can do this fairly easily now is that well, first, we have the information coming from these constellations of satellites, uh, but also we have the capability to process this information at scale uh, over entire regions like the Amazon. Um, and again, the, the idea behind these measurements is to enhance the quality of carbon offsets produced using uh, biomass and guarantee that the carbon that's supposed to uh, that is supposed to be sequestered by these projects is actually being sequestered. Uh, we can push things a little bit further, in fact, uh, using very high resolution images uh, on, in the optical domain. And we can even count individual trees. Um, so um, this is a, a project run in uh, collaboration with uh, Martin Brandt in Copenhagen. Uh, which allows us to count individual crowns and, and measure the size of individual crowns uh, uh, using high resolution optical images uh, and deep learning models. Um, so what all the small dots you see there are, are trees with um, uh, actual measurement of, of their height. And using uh, allometric equations, we can move from this tree count to a pr more precise measure of biomass uh, in, in being sequestered in the trees uh, themselves. So this is an, in, uh, this is an image in, the, uh, in, in a relatively dense forested, uh, densely forested area, but we can also run this in uh, uh, places like the Sahel and, and uh, Central Africa. And uh, uh, Martin Brandt has been, for example, using this technology to show that uh, there are many more trees 
in the Sahel than, than we expected and basically counted uh, every single one of them. And if I'm correct, I, uh, I remember there is something like 1.8 billion trees in, uh, in the Sahel, uh, very few of which have had been accounted for uh, un until now. So again, this is something we can do at scale uh, because one, the images are here, accessible, sometimes for free, like in the Sentinel case, or sometimes uh, commercially, like in this case for the high resol higher resolutions. Uh, but the images are here and the methods to handle these images are, are here too. And this sort of uh, uh, twin uh, progress in both uh, uh, data sources and uh, machine learning capabilities is what makes all these applications possible. So again, we can do this at uh, the scale of, of an entire region. So this is in the, the land region in, uh, in France. Uh, where we can, using machine um, machine learning and uh, uh, algorithms trained on LiDAR data, uh, we can plot uh, canopy height over the entire uh, region itself and detect clear cuts, uh, tree growth, and uh, forest uh, dynamics. We can also uh, um, classify. The machine learning is, uh, by design, very good at classifying things. Uh, and one thing we we can one of the quantities we can cl classify using machine learning and, and satellite multispectral images is is the tree species. So we can segment, for example, this forest in Poland uh, into seven dominant tree species and recognize the species automatically. And this is doable because uh, we have much more than simple um, uh, optical images. We have, if we use Sentinel, for example, 12 bands, including bands in the infrared. And so we have a much more, a much richer picture of the vegetation, uh, especially including these bands in the infrared domain. Uh, and we can measure uh, chlorophyll uh, activity, etc., et and and use this fine grained information in the spectral domain to classify species and categorize uh, 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 forest plots according to the dominant species. And again, that's important because well, these different species don't capture carbon in the similar way, don't grow at the similar at a similar pace. And so if, again, our objective is to measure how much of a carbon sink these forests are, classifying species is very important uh, so to, to run the allometric equations, which eventually produ produce uh, a measure of biomass and carbon sequestered. So again, this is something we can run at scale, uh, uh, thanks to Sentinel images and uh, machine learning. We can also measure uh, the risk, uh, how, how much at risk a particular forest uh, is. Uh, wildfires have become a very significant problem in places like California, which basically burns uh, significant, where significant uh, portions of the, the uh, biomass burn every year. And we can use, again, machine learning and earth observation to produce risk maps um, on a fire, wildfire risk related to a number of factors, such as proximity to infrastructure, in particular, electric lines, uh, power, uh, high voltage uh, power lines, um, proximity to railways, uh, and uh, proximity to uh, uh, urban uh, areas, and essentially produce these maps of, of uh, uh, wildfire risk uh, to help uh, um, uh, mitigate the, uh, the, the wildfire risk in, in very risky areas. And we can also use geostationary satellites to follow uh, the fires in, in real time. Um, one an, another technique. I hope the image is visible enough uh, on on the zoom side. Uh, one of the um, uh, technology provided by these new constellations of satellites is a three D stereo. So the idea is that the satellite moves uh, takes two images as a pair of images uh, with a, a slight shift in uh, um, uh, angle of vision. And this pair of images allows us to reconstruct a 3D representation of the forest using stereo imaging. So not only can we measure height, we can also produce images in sort of stereoscopic 3D uh, uh, of these uh, forests using 
the, the stereo tasking capabilities of, uh, of uh, some of these satellite constellations. So that was trees and uh, as, as a way of, of sequestering uh, carbon. Uh, again, the situation is changing fast because of Earth observation and machine learning. And uh, so uh, the reliability of carbon credits uh, uh, can be assessed in a much more uh, a faithful way than using sort of um, the classical, more classical methodologies based on sampling. Um, we can also sort of uh, uh, follow the carbon atom, the carbon molecule, using another set of uh, satellites uh, devoted to greenhouse gas emissions this time. And among these gases, the one that's of particular interest, uh, at least to us today, is methane. Uh, methane is responsible for about 30% of uh, global warming worldwide, but it's half of it comes from uh, 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 livestock and uh, agriculture, and the other half comes from uh, oil and gas activity. And uh, this oil and gas activity, the, the, the methane leaks um, uh, related to oil and gas ac uh, activity is one of the sort of lowest hanging fruit in the fight against uh, climate change. Uh, basically, um, using a satellite called Sentinel-5P, uh, which covers the entire surface of the Earth on a daily basis, we can detect methane leaks and, and uh, um, methane su super emitter source of very, very large scale sources of methane um, with a flux of about five to 10 tons per hour or above and a pixel resolution of five by seven uh, kilometers. So Sentinel-5P gives us an entire uh, an image of the entire globe uh, every day. And uh, the task then is to try to detect major sources in these images uh, automatically using machine learning. Uh, another satellite called Sentinel-2 allows us to do pretty much the same thing with slightly, uh, with a, a much lower spectral resolution, but a much better spatial resolution of about 20 meters. Uh, which allows us to detect uh, uh, large-scale uh, methane sources again and attribute them directly to a specific facility, which, uh, which helps uh, significantly mitigation. So using these satellites, we can do several things. We can look at uh, sort of large-scale accidental uh, releases of uh, methane, uh, and, and quantify these emissions. We can look at entire basins and try to understand how much these base, uh, methane basins emit overall. And we can try to do attribution. Uh, so basically pinpoint the exact facility from which the uh, leak originated. Fighting these, so, so before these satellites were launched, uh, especially Sentinel-5P, we sort of suspected that there were uh, super emitters uh, once in a while. We, we had observed a few super emitters uh, uh, every year, but the, the number of known events was sort of in the dozen. And running this uh, uh, satellite, so the, so, sorry, running machine learning uh, on the images provided by Sentinel-5P uh, over the entire globe, found about 30 of these sources every day. So uh, uh, these super emitters, thanks to the images provided by Sentinel-5P, were recognized as a much more major source of uh, uh, greenhouse gases than initially suspected. And you can clearly see here uh, uh, the uh, leaks following uh, the infrastructure, pipeline infrastructure in particular, in Russia, for example, you see major leaks over the Permian Basin, etc. All of these were completely um, unexpected in a sense before the satellite was launched. And if you make, uh, and if you estimate the total uh, amount of greenhouse uh, uh, global warming potential of these leaks, it turns out to be comparable to uh, the uh, global warming contribution of the airline sector. Uh, it, it's a trick, fairly tricky to try to ground. There are about 49 million flights uh, every year, and it's fairly tricky to ground them. Uh, on the other hand, uh, basically uh, resolving 
the, the, these leaks and improving operational standards so that these uh, massive methane leaks don't happen is, is, uh, can be done at almost zero cost and is, again, one of the lowest hanging fruits in the fight against uh, climate change. Uh, the, the, from a machine learning and sort of detection perspective, the problem looks like this. So you, you see that's a, a typical event next to a pipeline uh, with a pair of uh, sources at each end of a segment of a pipeline being maintained uh, under maintenance. Um, and so this is basically what the image looks like uh, before the detection algorithm is run. The idea is uh, using machine learning, we, we can focus and narrow down uh, our um, search to, we can identify the, these two leaks uh, automatically. And we then try to quantify them by running a, a, a simulation using uh, the weather patterns of, of, uh, of the uh, observed image. So another example below and the white areas you see here are essentially clouds. So unfortunately, and for obvious reasons, our observation capabilities are fairly limited by uh, by cloud cover. And so some areas are much easier to track than others, um, uh, but uh, uh, we still in, in many places get fairly clear pictures uh, like the one uh, below. So again, all of this is done automatically. It can be done uh, on the Sentinel-5P images with pixels uh, uh, of uh, about five by seven kilometers. It can also be done uh, using Sentinel-2 at much higher resolution with 20 meter pixels. And this is, for example, a leak around a gas compressor station in the Permian Basin in uh, Texas that runs for uh, about two weeks uh, without interruption. So uh, again, this is the kind of event that we should not be seeing uh, in, in the near future. Um, and in fact, the Inflation Reduction Act uh, has created uh, penalties per ton uh, uh, of uh, methane emitted, um, and, and will start to regulate uh, these leaks. Um, there has been a considerable effort to validate the satellite approach in uh, detection and quantification of uh, uh, methane leaks. Um, and so in particular, a group at Stanford has run controlled methane releases uh, coordinated with a number of uh, uh, labs and firms quantifying methane emissions to try to benchmark the uh, precision of uh, methane detection and quantification algorithms. And the results are out and the error uh, rates are, are fairly reasonable. Um, and so uh, in fact, uh, the system uh, I've just showed you is, is operational enough to, to be uh, feeding uh, the International Methane Observatory, which has created a, an alerting system, which takes these leaks and uh, uh, notifies the corresponding operators uh, to in an effort to uh, try to fix them. So uh, hopefully... Uh, if I show you this uh, uh, map in a few years from now, um, it should be a lot cleaner than it is today. So methane, 30% of uh, global warming potential, half of that coming from the oil and gas sector, now visible from space using Sentinel-5P. Uh, so hopefully uh, uh, soon, we'll see uh, these emissions uh, being uh, reduced. CO2 emissions are of course very important as well. We do not have at this point, the same imaging capabilities uh, on, on CO2 than the, the ones we have on methane uh, because the naturally occurring CO2, uh, sort of non-anthropogenic uh, CO2 uh, usually dominates the picture uh, around uh, most uh, sites. But we can measure CO2 uh, using remote sensing in an indirect way. Uh, and that's important because, uh, again, CO2 emissions have started to be regulated at the continental scale. So the EU, for example, has a carbon uh, emission trading system uh, regulating CO2 emissions from major industrial players. And uh, China and the UK will have one soon. There is a Western Climate Initiative doing something similar in California and uh, 
Canada. Um, and so if we want to regulate uh, CO2, we need to be able to measure it. And in addition to that, uh, since some regions like the European Union will start to tax uh, carbon embedded in imports, uh, you need to be able to measure uh, CO2 emissions uh, remotely, uh, so somewhat accurately. And satellites uh, allow you to do that uh, fairly explicitly. Um, and the idea, if you want to cover in sort of uh, in an exhaustive way the, the emissions of a country is to use a, a variety of sensors to track industrial and commercial and transport activity um, uh, worldwide. So on shipping, for example, we have AIS data to track ship movements. In aviation, we have ADSB sensors giving us, again, um, plane location and, and vectors. On uh, heavy industry, we have satellites looking in the infra infrared domain that allow us to track activity. Same thing for power generation. Uh, we have satellite imagery uh, allow us to, allowing us to uh, track uh, activity. And on transport, we have a geolocation data, which gives us an idea of how much miles are being uh, uh, covered by how much traffic there is basically. Uh, worldwide. So this is an example of uh, how we measure CO2 emissions indirectly using remote sensing. So this is Sentinel-2 infrared imaging. So uh, uh, we track images in the infrared domain. And, and this is a cement plant in China. And the cement plants, the large scale ones at least, have these rotary uh, kilns that, that um, produce a lot of heat when they are active. And we can track the, this heat signature uh, using the, the Sentinel satellite uh, from the, the Copernicus constellation. And you can see here that um, some of these uh, kins are, are sort of alternating on and off uh, over the period. And we can use that as a proxy for emissions uh, once we have um, an idea of the em corresponding emission factors. We can do the same thing with car traffic. Uh, now, it, this is not satellite anymore. It's remote sensing using geolocation data, uh, typically GPS apps or uh, apps which uh, share your lo location, such as uh, weather apps, for example. Um, and uh, we can use that to measure traffic at key intersections, for example, in a, a road network. Uh, and get an idea of how much residential and commercial traffic there is in these cities and compute corresponding emissions using emission factors. Uh, this is another example using heat signatures on the left-hand side here uh, for a power plant in Libya or another gas power plant in Brazil. In both cases, the heat signature of the plant itself gives you an idea of its activity and you can use emission factors to uh, deduce um, uh, carbon CO2 emissions. We can do something similar, again, using machine learning on um, a coal plant in on this coal plant in Pakistan, looking at uh, a cooling tower activity this time and a, a plume of vapor uh, that you can detect using uh, optical imaging. Um, so uh, we can use an, these um, these techniques to uh, get a complete picture of uh, uh, power plants and uh, 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 power generation activity in places like uh, China, for example. Uh, and um, uh, we can do something similar for the cement in the industry, uh, which is uh, one of the leading producers of uh, CO2 uh, emissions uh, because Manufacturing uh, a clinker uh, is a, a, a clinkerization uh, produces CO2 uh, as a, a chemical byproduct. Uh, and so in 2018, for example, in Europe, uh, the CO2 production was about 600 kilograms of CO2 per ton of clinker. Um, and uh, so measuring activity of a plant and its production is a good proxy for its uh, CO2 emissions. Um, and so the idea is, again, to use machine learning to identify the hotspots uh, that uh, give away a signal about activity and then track using Sentinel images 
uh, the amount of uh, activity uh, on a near de nearly daily basis. Um, and so this, this um, uh, remote sensing capability, again, using uh, uh, infrared imaging, gives us a fairly precise picture of uh, cement production in China, for example, uh, with a very high accuracy compared to uh, uh, official uh, statistics. Uh, and the, the reason why cement is particularly interesting, of course, it's a natural source of uh, CO2 emissions, but it's also a very good proxy for economic activity. Uh, why? Because cement is actually very, very cheap. And so it, it never really travels much. Uh, and so uh, basically, um, cement plants are a very good in indicator of uh, real estate activity uh, and housing sector activity in a specific location. And uh, that since the uh, housing sector activity itself is a, one of the main components of GDP, uh, this cement plant tracking uh, algorithm is both useful from a climate perspective, but also from a sort of economic policy perspective. And uh, finally, uh, another uh, area where um, um, remote sensing and satellites can be uh, directly useful is flooding monitoring. Uh, the idea here is to work both uh, on risk evaluation, so trying to understand which locations are at particular risk of uh, flooding, and during an event, produce live flooding maps and, and monitor in real time the impact of a flood uh, and uh, its impact on population, infrastructure, or, or buildings um, with a, a small enough uh, uh, time lag. And the reason we can do this, again, is because uh, we have satellites uh, operating in the radar domain, and um, uh, water and flooded areas essentially appear as black in these images compared to uh, vegetation, for example, which backscatters uh, uh, radar in a fairly significant way, or buildings, which have also a fairly significant uh, a radar signature. So we can use uh, synthetic aperture radar satellites to map flooded areas in real time. So that's an image where you see, uh, for example, it's a radar image where you see these floods appear in, uh, in black. And uh, we can process uh, these uh, uh, radar images again using signal processing and machine learning to identify water mask and measure uh, uh, somewhat accurately uh, how much um, uh, of the uh, surface is, is being flooded. So that's an example uh, comparing uh, SAR and radar images with uh, the uh, optical domain images corresponding uh, on, the, on the ground. So this is a, a, a gold mine um, that's being partially flooded. And um, we can use also 3D reconstruction to get up-to-date uh, digital terrain elevation uh, um, model um, here at 80 centimeter uh, resolution. And again, try to understand both the risk and the way the flooding itself is going to propagate. And um, and on top of that, if we cross this, cross this information with uh, population uh, uh, data, we, we can get a fairly accurate measure, measure of how, how much of the population is being affected um, by a particular flooding event. So again, well, basically, uh, this remote sensing slash machine learning combination covers pretty much the entire life cycle of the carbon atom we can look at uh, oil and gas production. We can look at uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and we can look at sequestration uh, in, in forests. And finally, we can also uh, follow the uh, consequences of climate change, namely flooding and wildfires. So in all these areas, which are critical to understand the carbon life cycle and uh, global warming in general, uh, remote sensing can produce uh, very uh, uh, impactful and actionable numbers. Um, 
And so now I'm going to do something that uh, you shouldn't do during a live video presentation, which is uh, run a small demo. Um, so let me check. Um, okay, give me one second. Okay, so that's the uh, this this is a sort of dynamic version of the methane emission map I showed you earlier, and uh, so basically starting in 2019, we we uh, uh, scanned every day uh, the entire surface of the Earth using Sentinel-5P, and uh, try to detect methane hotspots, uh, so large methane sources in um, uh, these uh, images and then finally try to quantify all of these sources uh, and so measure the amount of methane emitted uh, every single time. And you get something like this. Uh, in India, for example, these are mostly um, uh, landfills. The, the dots you see here follow closely uh, pipelines and so are probably uh, methane emissions related to maintenance events. Uh, you see a lot of detections in the uh, oil basins, notably the, the Permian over here in the US, uh, and also a lot of sources in places like Turkmenistan, which is uh, uh, a traditional heavy uh, emitter of uh, methane. And we can look a little bit more in detail at these sources. So this is a fairly classical. So the, the map of infrastructure is not completely precise, but this is a typical uh, uh, methane emission from pipeline maintenance. Uh, you see two sources, a pair of sources separated by a few dozen miles where the methane has been vented in the atmosphere uh, to, uh, to practice uh, to, to main, uh, during a maintenance event uh, on the pipeline itself. So burning that methane would divide its impact on the uh, on, on global warming by a factor of 100. And so uh, basically the idea here is to push for uh, flaring of, the, of these um, uh, maintenance uh, uh, events. We can also look, we can also track methane, at least very large sources using geostationary uh, satellites. And so here, for example, you see an event in Mexico with a major leak that was tracked by uh, a GOES, which is a geostationary satellite uh, over the US. And, and in this case, you get a full sort of video of the, um, of the source itself. Um, and you can measure how uh, pr fairly precisely how long it lasted and how much uh, 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 methane was uh, emitted in total. Um, so that's it for the super emitters. We can do uh, a similar set uh, sort of tracking on at the basin level, at the level of a basin, and, and try to compute how much methane is emitted by a certain uh, um, uh, oil and gas exploration basin. So this is, for example, an estimate for the Permian in the US. Um, and we can do uh, CO2 and track CO2 activity, um, CO2 emissions at the regional uh, uh, level. Uh, so um, here, for example, we can break down uh, methane, em uh, sorry, CO2 emissions from coal, for example, using the procedure I, I detailed earlier, uh, basically tracking activity and using emission factors gas, oil, and waste, and uh, cement, for example. Uh, so this is cement production in uh, emissions related to cement production in the European uh, Union. Uh, and so this allows us to track uh, activity and trends 
for all these regions and see how close their, um, uh, these regions are from their uh, 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 advertised emission targets. Um, so domestic aviation is here um, and soon we'll have um, shipping as well. That's it for me. Thank you very much. And I'll be very happy to answer questions if there are any. Thanks, thanks so much um, uh, for the very informative and very motivating talk with all these uh, methodologies and, and, and applications of machine learning. Um, I, I think that I'm pretty sure that there are a lot of questions and doubts and curiosities and maybe food for thought in the, in the in the channels and people is is about asking things. Uh, but in the meantime, maybe I just to a kind of a warming up, maybe I can uh, shoot some questions myself. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, all the all the all these um, examples of machine learning, uh, they look excellent, right? I mean, they, they look like uh, uh, they work and they 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 actually have like a lot of uh, both economical, uh, social, and environmental implications, of course. Uh, um, but you didn't really touch upon the methodologies themselves. No. Right? I mean, it was it was it was really clear that the applications were as focus of the talk. I, I don't know. I, I would like to to know a little bit about the, the the methodologies that you are actually using for for because you have like um, a lot of detection, change detection classification and also there are some applications that show that you show at the very beginning when when dealing with forests on, on estimation right or regression problems maybe so i don't know I, I would like to to know a little bit more about the methodologies that you are actually developing or using in the in the in this processing pipelines yeah so uh so there are, it, it it depends on the topic so uh, to start with methane for example uh we we have a problem which is fairly easy to spell out. We get a full image of the Earth uh, every day from Sentinel-5P. Mm -hmm. We look at uh, uh, the signature corresponding to uh, methane, so uh, the, the absorption bands corresponding to methane. And so mm -hmm. we basically get a methane concentration image every day. And in this methane concentration image every day, we need to find hotspots, uh, very significant sources. And what we noticed is that this looks very much like a, a problem in astronomy, where you you try to look for an event in the, in the in the in the sky, um, like something like a comet, for example. And so we we used an, an algorithm from astronomy to detect these um, uh, methane sources automatically. There's significant then uh, uh, ground uh, verification process. Uh, to make sure that what we see is actually a methane plume and not uh, some some artifact from albedo or, or um, uh, aerosol, for example. Mm -hmm. But basically, the detection problem itself is is coming from astro astronomy. At higher mm -hmm. resolutions, where you get a little bit more texture uh, using Sentinel-2, for example, we run a deep learning model to try to identify plumes uh, mm -hmm. because the resolution of Sentinel-2 is 20 meters, and the plumes have a much more specific sort of visual signature and texture, which is good for for using uh, deep learning. So uh, it, it it depends on the application. So sometimes we use more traditional signal processing uh, methods. Sometimes we use uh, deep learning, depending on on what the data actually looks like. Um, yeah, I was also curious about well, in general, in all the applications that you showed us. I mean, you you will at some point you will have to report these numbers, right? To to institutions or yes. governments or you mentioned IMEO, right? Yeah. Uh, at some point, and I guess that all I mean it is not enough. I guess with just the point wise estimate, right? Uh, you will have certainly to to provide kind of error bars or uncertainty uncertainty estimates. Absolutely, because otherwise it, I don't know. It's it's like. <laughs> Uh, too much, no? Uh, I don't yeah, know if absolutely. you say something about what, how, how do you handle uncertainty in your, in your processing pipelines? Or... So uh, there are a few. We first sort of uh, measure uh, 
uh, uncertainty using a, a sort of Monte Carlo approach. There is mm -hmm. uncertainty on the weather input, on the wind speed, etc. So all of this is sort of fairly well understood and can be used to generate error bars around our estimates. Mm -hmm. But we also uh, tested the, 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 the quality and the precision of our, our estimation methodology using this controlled release by Stanford, for example. Okay. And um, and so one of the objectives of this control release was to try to confirm that the uncertainty and error bars we are producing for these uh, estimates were actually reliable. And, and they were. And very roughly speaking, the uncertainty is about 30% um, on, on all these numbers, which is big, but, but not completely outrageous either. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was about to say. Yeah. Yes. I guess that you cannot do do it better. I don't know because of what because of the limitation and data or so uh, in cases. For example, you mentioned on, on the methane plume. Well, weather weather is is a, a big issue. So getting accurate information on wind speed, wind speed is is very critical to uh, to uh, flow rate estimation, and getting reliable numbers on wind speed is is not always uh, um, trivial. Mm -hmm. so, Weather is a big source of uncertainty, uh, otherwise albedo and uh, uh, basically noise in the image itself is another yeah. key source of, um, of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I would say that weather and getting more accurate weather data would help a lot. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, I, I guess that in all these applications, because they are very impactful, I would say, you know, uh, um, and, and probably they can trigger Either alarms or alerts, right? Of you know this this burst and emissions that you showed us in this very nice video. Uh, probably there's a, a, a policy action afterwards, right? So so that should follow somehow. I don't know. Hopefully, right? Well, hopefully, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I, I guess that this all, all these all these uh, let's say predictions decisions that you or, or potential actions that one has to to follow up. Uh, they have to be kind of back up with some kind of explanation, right? So it is not about the prediction itself only, but okay, why is this due or why this is actually happening? Are, are, are you supposed to report also an explanation accompanying the, the, so, the prediction or? or... I, I Basically we report a, a, a detection and we use another satellite, which I haven't uh, really uh, showed uh, today, which is Sentinel-3 to try to pinpoint the precise facility from which the, 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 the emission was coming. And that's okay. the only way to do proper attribution. Yes. Sentinel-5P has a resolution that's too coarse to do attribution. And so we rely on Sentinel-3 actually, which mm -hmm. has a, pixel resol a ground resolution of 500 meters mm -hmm. to try to uh, track down the, uh, the exact source. And so given Sentinel-5P basically certifies that what you're seeing is methane, Sentinel-3 tells you where this methane is coming from. Yeah. And that yeah. basically makes it actionable. Yes, yes. Well, you also mentioned about the this um, this climate risk mapping, right? On these maps on wildfires and uh, uh, this wildfire risk, actually, right? Uh, it's, yes. it, it's, uh, we have been working uh, very recently in, in similar similar problems. And I guess that you are also ingesting not only remote sensing data, but also weather data, I guess, right? Uh, yes, for, absolutely. Yes, because that, that should play a, a, a role, right? In the, yeah, yeah, historical weather patterns are, are absolutely key. Yes, yes, yes. And and did you did you run kind of, a, I don't know, explainable AI techniques to, to know what is actually more relevant in what circumstances or, I don't know, right? <laughs> Yeah, yes and no. So we 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 in fact use a grid and boosting, uh -huh. and, um, and uh, um, uh, basically look at uh, the sensitivity of the model to try to make it as it's a fairly uh, reasonably small uh, uh, network in the end, in the end, and so um, we we can then test sensitivity to see which topics uh, dominate uh, the yeah. picture. And, and uh, uh, you're absolutely right, weather and historical weather patterns are, are fundamental here. Yes, yes. And and I was also very 
Interesting. I mean, it's just a curiosity, right? Like you, you have been yeah. showing like a, 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 a wide range of publications that eventually, I don't know how, if one can actually use or transport uh, a model developed for something, for let's say wildfire detection, uh, transport it into another, into another field, let's say methane plume detection. I don't know if you're reusing models or there is kind of a transfer learning thing uh, that one could reuse models or at least some pipelines. Uh, um, that could be a, really interesting to see, I don't know. Yeah, so we we, we, are, we are facing this question fairly often, uh, in particular on high resolution images because uh, we use a, a mixture of, uh, of uh, constellations mm -hmm. uh, to uh, to de do our detections, and in particular, we were using both Sentinel and Landsat, whose resolutions are not totally similar, and so we do a, a fair, fair amount of transfer learning to uh, recycle our models from one constellation to another in in high resolution. Yes, definitely. That that's yeah. that's something that we should yeah. There are a bunch of questions in the chat, actually. Okay. People, people is really excited about your talk and, and about the perspectives of your of your work. And there is one saying that, uh, well, thank you for your presentation. Uh, what is your perspective on a company scale? Very high resolution CO2 and methane model trend. Uh, do you think it will play a role for environmental compliance and inspection in future? I think I think this is a, like you know an umbrella question, right? Like yes, an yes, yes. Question. So. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think I think that obviously it should play a role. I don't know how far we are about you know uh, uh, politicians and governments and, and institutions uh, like uh, taking this uh, decision. No, but it's a it, it's it's a it's a basically it's a very active area of uh, interest right now. And in mm -hmm. fact, um, uh, it, it's being pushed. The question is being pushed by uh, uh, asset managers. Who want to rank uh, the companies in their portfolio according to their uh, environmental performance? Mm -hmm. Want to use emissions data to do so, and so it, it's it's not a done deal for sure because tracking down company assets and measuring related emissions is is tricky. But but clearly there's a there's a huge demand on the asset management uh, side for uh, clear benchmarks. Uh, in, in this area so it's going to happen it's just it's tricky but it's going to happen yes yes there there is a very interesting question maybe tricky question as well um on carbon credits um um yeah the 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 yeah there is this question about the uh, yeah when companies want to offset their emissions by purchasing land let's say that is likely to be deforest deforested isn't it that a kind of a concern that big enterprises end up like owing these large pieces of land and, and for example in the Amazon? So just to offset it. I think that this is one of the things that your guys are trying to report, right? And detect or yeah. yes. So I don't think the mechanism itself does not uh include transfer of ownership. So the credit is just emitted uh so they are not directly purchasing land. They are they are basically paying for uh, forest uh, uh, a forest to be grown on on specific plot of land. Mm -hmm. I don't think there is any transfer of ownership. So, sure. uh, but I'm not an expert on on the legal aspects of these things. <laughs> uh, the, the 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 key issue is to make sure that the forest that's supposed to be planted is planted and actually survives. Uh, long enough to sequester carbon at a fast rate. Yes, I, I think that this is, there is another another general question. I think it, it appears in almost every talk. It's about the data availability. Uh, mm -hmm. um, so how, how do you get the data? Let's say for training these models, of course, Sentinel two, you can you can get this data uh, for free because of the Copernicus uh, um, uh, program. But uh, what about the label data that you would need to to train or is all the methodologies that you're applying are unsupervised or how does this work? Uh, at the end of the day, you will have to evaluate or, or quantify the, the, yeah. the quality um, of your estimates and, and uh, detections, right? So how do you get this data? Um, uh, so on sequestration, so we combine Sentinel data, which is public, with JEDI. And uh -huh. JEDI uh, is uh, uh, LIDAR, whose data is also public. And mm -hmm. so... We we use we use a lot. We mostly use uh, public data sets. In fact, 
Um, and uh, but it's it's still fairly high volumes of data. But Co Copernicus and and the Sentinel constellation have just launched a new service, giving you uh, a sort of comprehensive access to the the Sentinel product in a fairly uh, a smooth way. So most of the data we use is is uh, is uh, basically open source. Uh, but sometimes for the the high resolution tree counting example, you have to uh, either get the data as part of an academic program using a, a planet a planet scope for example or buy very high resolution data sets from uh, people like airbus uh, pleiad neo etc with mm -hmm. a resolution closer to 30 centimeters and this data is is only available commercially then yeah. and I, I think that there is no talk without the uh, a question referring to chat gpt and uh, we have one here of course uh, there is uh, an attendee asking, well, first of all, thanks for the, your excellent presentation. What are your view of possible applications of, of large language models in Earth observation? I don't know if you're exploring this or not. Or is, uh, so we, we are know. exploring this uh, to, uh, to basically track down and uh, assets, industrial assets, and do attribution. Uh -huh. uh, so uh, basically, we need to find uh, who is behind are the methane these methane sources for example and so tracking down assets uh, uh, and uh, uh, understanding company reports and parsing on company reports using large language models is uh, fairly useful in this sense otherwise if if you're allowed to dream a little bit um, the idea would be to have something similar for earth observation images than what we have for text today so instead of doing uh, text question answering we, we, we hopefully at some point will be able to run something more akin to visual question answering. So how much of this forested area has burned in the last 10 years? Uh, what are the facilities uh, emitting the largest amount of methane in, in a particular basin, et cetera? So visual question answering is sort of the visual version of what we're doing now with large language models it's mm -hmm. not at all as advanced as a, a question simple question answering but but eventually we hope it will get there and and allow us to query directly these large databases of uh, images in yes. in natural language good thanks thanks so much i think that we don't have any further question in the in the chat I think that it was it was a really great discussion uh, around a very timely and important topics, uh, you know, on deforestation, on wildfires, on methane fumes of detection. Uh, well, th thanks so much, Alex, for, for presenting and answering all these questions. It was really fantastic to have you here. My pleasure. Uh, I, think, I think that now it's, it's time for closing the session. Uh, thanks again for the talk and all the attendees, and uh, thanks for staying with us too. And, and remember that you can still continue the conversations uh, if you want uh, for some more minutes in the neural network uh, area uh, that you, if you are actually registered there, um, that is actually a good opportunity to follow up with you know more detailed questions or more more technical questions if you want. Um, and well, we hope to we hope to see you in our next talk in our seminar series on AI for Earth and Sustainability Science. And if you want to know more on the role of AI for Earth and climate, you can also follow up the, like our you know conversations and seminars in, in our sister seminar series AI for Climate Science. Thanks everyone, and uh, have a good day, all of you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for participating in today's AI for Good session. We hope you've learned something new, innovative, and engaging in today's event. We now encourage you to continue the conversation on the live video wall in the neural network. Here you can ask questions. Like and comment, share links, complete the poll, connect with interesting profiles, or speak one-on-one -on -one using the chat and video function. We invite you to explore the lobby, try the smart matching quiz, visit the virtual exhibits, poster boards, the eShop, and build your personalized AI for Good program. Let's shape the future of AI for Good.
the AI for Good Global Summit convened by ITU recognizes the joint responsibility of governments, the private sector, United Nations agencies, academia and others to ensure AI reaches its full potential while preventing and mitigating harms. And it's a moment that calls for action. And today I'm calling on each of you, each of you to use this summit to help the world to better understand what kinds of regulations, what kinds of guardrails we need to put in place right now. So together, let's make it innovative, let's make it safe, and let's make it responsible for all. Thank you very much.